Thank you so much for watching Bethel Assembly Online today. During this series, The Be Attitudes, we will learn that being blessed is not always about receiving, but it's about having the right attitude. I encourage you that during this series, open your hearts and minds to what God may be speaking to you. If you have any questions, need prayer, or would like to support this ministry financially, please visit our website at BethelLife.com. Thanks again for watching. We've been in this series on Beatitudes, and over the last few weeks, we've been talking out of Matthew chapter 5, and we've been talking about this uh, conversation that Jesus has. Now, in Matthew 5, we've looked at the Beatitudes, it's kind of earned the phrase, the Sermon on the Mount, and we've kind of thought that this is this message that Jesus spoke to the multitudes of people that were gathering around the countryside, coming to hear him because of all of his miracles and all the things he was saying. But in reality, what he was doing is actually speaking to his disciples. He wasn't speaking to the masses because he gathered his disciples around because when he saw all the people, sometimes we have to learn how to deal with people. Okay. Now, how many of you like people? Raise your hand. Okay. The rest of you that aren't raising your hand that don't like people, you're still stuck with us. Okay. All right. So we have to understand how to work with people. And what the Beatitudes do is they speak to the motives of our heart. It talks about the motives of what's going on inside of us. Because we can talk about the gifts of the spirit. We can talk about the fruit of the spirit. But until we have the right motives in our heart, that stuff never works out quite right. It just never comes to fruition the way it should, the way God intended it. So we got to understand the, the beatitudes or the motives of our heart. So I want you to jump into Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 1 this morning. Okay? And I want to take you back here. We've looked at this passage, but I want to set it up again. This is page 677 in that Bible. It's in a seat pocket nearby you. So if you don't have a Bible, you can grab that one. It's always great to uh, look in the Bible for yourself. Never take a preacher's word for it. Okay? And that sounds horrible to say, I know, but you need to always look in the Bible for yourself, all right? All right, page 677, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So we see this isn't to the multitudes, this is to his disciples. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, you're simply his disciple. You and I, when we have a relationship with Jesus, we've allowed him to be the Lord and Savior of our life. We've let him come into our life then we're his disciples. So he's speaking to us. This is a message that is for us in the motives of our hearts. And the motives of our heart are huge. And they make a massive impact in how we deal with people, don't they? They do. Well, the first uh, beatitude that we've studied, and we've done this in kids' church also, is blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And to just simplify that, to break it down to its simplest form, it would be, I need God's help. I can't do this life on my own. I'm just not good enough to get to heaven. I need God's help. Uh, the second one was, blessed are those who mourn. And that just means I am sensitive to God's spirit. If he's saying something to my mind or my heart, I, I can understand that. And then the third one we're going to look at today is Matthew 5.5, 5, same page in your Bible, 677. It says this, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, the simplest way to interpret that would be, I'm not weak. I am strong mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, but I'm also easy to live with because sometimes we can just be strong and, and not so miserable. easy to live with, <laughs> but you are very but easy to live with. <laughs> we're talking about being meek today where we are strong and easy to live with. And as a mom, Wow, we need this more than ever because mothering is an art. It is a unique skill. It takes time. It doesn't happen naturally. Uh, just because you gave birth doesn't make you an amazing mom. Um, it takes trial and error and then trial and error again. Um, it takes a lifetime to er learn the art of motherhood. So watch this little video with us. It's that time of year again, Mother's Day, the one day of the year devoted to the celebration of the special women in our lives. Mom! But is one day enough time to adequately express our appreciation and love for our mothers? No, no it's not. No it is not. Because a mother is much more than just a nurturer, specializing in crustless sandwiches and painless band-aid removal. Brenna, seriously, get up. A mother is also a motivator, knowing when a gentle nudge is needed. 
Brenna. Mom! A mother instinctively knows when to offer tender words of encouragement. Hey, you guys have a good day. Mommy loves you. Bye-bye. Make good choices. Mwah, hugs and kisses. She is always available to offer wisdom and instruction. Can we just solve her Y? X is being difficult. As well as correction when needed. A mother is ready at a moment's notice with a creative idea. How am I gonna go to the bathroom? Well, you can't, because you'll rust. And she always presents a patient and supportive attitude. Hey, how many does this feed? Uh, about six, I think. Cool. Why? Air conditioning's not working in the theater. Everyone's coming here. You see, the word mother is also a verb, to bring up a child with care and affection. The art of mothering. So a mother, along with everything else, is an artist too, participating with God to mold, shape, and refine his precious works of art. Of course, some need a little more refining than others. Yes. Yes, they do. Moms are great, aren't they? <laughs> Moms do so much. You know, uh, blessed are the meek. In other words, I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. You know, that reality is huge. And I, I think as moms, we see that as moms. And I'm saying that like I know um, I'm not a mom. But uh, in case you didn't, we're wondering. Um, I think the reality is, is when I look at moms, though, and I look at what Melanie does every day, the amount of time she puts into children, the shaping that takes place. And when I, uh, as I reflect back on what my own mom had to do, oh, you are all saints. That's all I have to say. You're all saints. I want to focus in on this word meek for a second. If you look in the Greek... It is called prahus. Prahus is this powerful word that describes the immense power of God under control. See, God could really just take us all out if he wanted to. He has this amazing power, but yet in all of his authority and all of his power, he keeps it under control because he focuses it. And the reality is, is when we look at being meek, we have this immense power within us. We have something that's strong within us but yet we're easy to live with in the essence of, you know what, we control it. We control it and we let the strength be seen when it needs to be seen. And we are gentle when we need to be gentle, all those things. It's that control perspective. And when we look at the life of Jesus, I believe he modeled this idea of being meek so well. We're going to look at a few components of Jesus's life where we see him modeling this for us. Because there's some components that we have to get if we're going to be meek. All right. Blessed are the meek. The first one is Jesus is that he is authoritative, but humble. He's authoritative, but humble. And I think sometimes uh, those of us, we kind of get in these, you know, power trips. We kind of get these title mentalities. We want that management position. We want all these things. And we can get this authoritative perspective, but we're not always so humble. Look at uh, Matthew 7, verse 28. This is page 679 in that Bible. Uh, if you grab it out of the seat pocket, Matthew 7, verse 28 said, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority and not as the other teachers of the law. See, the reality is, is when you look at the things that Jesus would say, for instance, he said, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes into the Father except through me. That's a pretty bold statement. That's a very bold statement from the perspective of, at that time, that wasn't politically correct whatsoever. 
Jesus was not somebody that operated in the gray. He was always saying, this is how it is. And even though he would command authority like no other teacher of the law, and he would say, I am the only way. You want to know the Father, it's got to come through me, through my sacrifice, through my life. When that kind of statement is made, it's huge. Because also at the same time, we see him doing something that's absolutely powerful. It's absolutely powerful because what he does is he realizes that he has come from the Father to serve people. And uh, when you look at that, it's huge because he even washed people's feet. Somebody who's authoritative in that nature and said, you know, we've never heard anybody like him. But he even washed his disciples' feet and never demanded it in return. Now, when we talk about meek and blessed are the meek and we talk about moms because it's Mother's Day, all of us guys, we can probably tune out and start thinking about the NFL draft again, okay? All right? We need to, I want to pull you back in for a second, guys. All right? Listen to me for a minute. This idea of blessed are the meek, this idea that we're strong, but we're easy to live with is huge. We all in this room need this. It's not just, now moms live it out probably better than the rest of us guys, but we need to get this for a second, okay? We are in this study in our men's group, and so I got to just do a little promo action, okay, real quick. Tuesday night, 630. Guys, if you're free, we have a men's group that we meet uh, right below this room. And we've been going through this uh, teaching called the kingdom man. It's been awesome. And one of the things that we talked about just this past week was that we talked about that in uh, Numbers chapter 12, we see that Moses was the meekest man on the face of earth. Now, now, this guy that teaches this uh, class on, on this book on uh, the kingdom man, he put it this way. You imagine the guy who goes into Egypt to get the Israelites set free, right? He's the one that has the staff that turns into snakes. He's got all the plagues. He does all this crazy stuff, right? You, he is the meekest person, and he goes in and he gets them set free. This is how we put it. Moses ain't no chump. This idea of being meek, though, we kind of put it in this perspective of we're kind of just passive. We're soft and gentle. And the reality is, is that some moms aren't soft and gentle. They've got to command authority when it's needed. All right? And guys, we need to understand the same thing. And we, this is a powerful statement from Tony Evans from the book Kingdom Man. God will make you meek so he can make you great. And the reality is, guys, is we need to know this principle also. We can't just put it all on moms and say, well, that's mom's job. No, no, no. This motive of the heart was spoken to disciples. We're all his disciples. And this motive we need to understand because we want the promotion. We want that management position. We want to have recognition. We just, you know, guys, we want to be honored sometimes. We want to have that pride perspective. But the reality is this. God wants to make us meek so that he can make us great. If you'll be humble as Jesus was humble, he'll make you great. That's good. That's good. Say amen. There we go. All right, you're awake with me. Well, since Jared's promoting the men's Bible study, I will promote the women's Bible study because we also meet on Tuesday nights at 6.30 in the atrium. And we're going through this study called A Thousand Gifts. And often as a mom, I have endless jobs to do, and I try to hurry and get them all done. And as a children's pastor, I have endless amount of work to do, and I try to hurry and get it all done. And as a wife, I have endless things I probably should be doing, and I try to hurry and get through them all. Um, but this but you study love those things. Is, encouraging us to slow down and to take a breath and to capture the moments that God's given us. And, and we refer to them as grace moments in this study. And so we're, we're stopping and we're writing them down in our little joy journals. And I got to be honest with you, most of my grace moments are truly about my children and just the smiles on their face and their big toothy grins. And, um, you notice how she didn't say me. The way they always say, is this a bad word? And fun stuff like that. Um, but you know what? Jesus was the same way because he loved children. He stopped all this amazing teaching he did, and he stopped and focused on kids. In Luke 18, uh, page 732 in that Bible, Luke eighteen sixteen, it says this. Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Man, I understand that kids... Although they enjoy technical devices, they don't need them. They are more than happy with the cardboard box that came in the mail. They love a marker and a crayon, and life is good. They don't need any gourmet food. You know, a hot dog is the best thing in the whole world. Kids smile at the littlest things, and Jesus knew this. Jesus wanted us to have that same principle in life. 
as a mom, our number one disciple is our children. That's right. As the children's pastor of Bethel Assembly, my number one disciple is my children. And I think Andy Stanley said it best. He said, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone that you raise. That's good. I think when you consider that Jesus was authoritative but humble, the second thing we see is that he's active but dependent. He's absolutely active but dependent. You know, Jesus was no slouch. He was definitely not lazy. If you just look at from the time he was 30 to the age 33 when he would go to die on the cross, in those short three years of his ministry, if you were to go and look at a map and see every year where he would spend his ministry and his time, he traveled all around what we look at as now the country of Israel, and he would travel all over, and the miles that he put on were amazing. Many of us don't walk that in probably two years or three years or even 10 years. I mean, you look at this, this man wasn't lazy by any standard. He was so active. He was always going. He was always serving. But what was amazing is that he was always dependent. I mean, even at the age of uh, 12, he understood the principle of serving because he was in the synagogue studying scripture and he was, had this perspective since a little boy. He was huge in this. But with everything, he only did what the father told him. I think a lot of times, don't we get so busy that we never step back and we become dependent on the father, do we? We never step back and say, you know what? I'm so busy. Oh, wait, time out. I got to just get with God for a minute. Sometimes we get so busy and we get so reliant on upon ourselves that we lose this perspective. And this is a huge perspective if we're going to be meek, is that we need to understand that we can be active, but we need to be fully dependent upon the Father. This is what Jesus said in John 5, 19. This is page 743 if you want to turn there in that Bible. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. This is an aspect that we need to learn. We become so busy in today's society that we never take the time to become dependent upon our Heavenly Father. Jesus understood that. And it was a component to his meekness. This was a huge component to his meekness. Sometimes we got to get off our duff. Sometimes we got to get motivated to get off of our tail. All right? But the reality is, too, is we can get so busy that we forget to even acknowledge him or communicate with him or be dependent upon him for direction. And we need that so desperately. Jesus blended this idea of activity and um, reliance upon the Father so well. The third thing that we see Jesus do, so uh, after, after he's active but dependent, after he's you know, authoritative but humble, we see then that he's courageous but wise. He's courageous but wise. How many of you have some people, you know some people, don't raise your hand, I don't want to pull you out there, but there, some of us have, we know people in our lives that you know, they just jump headfirst into something, don't they? They never, they never count the cost, right? They're the people that are on the cliffs at the lake, you know, and they're diving, you know, they never check the water. It's those people. They're courageous. But sometimes we've got to be wise, too. And Jesus was that. He was courageous but wise. He didn't base any decisions on fear. He didn't base any decisions on fear. And this is something that Mel and I actually have been talking about. This is something we've pledged to do together throughout this year. Is that I think a lot of times when th- decisions come our way in life, they're made out of fear. What's this person going to think about me? Or how is this going to be perceived? Or, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to hurt. I, I don't, we, we get like that. And we become fear-based in making our decisions. And when we're courageous but wise, we understand the perspective that we're not going to be controlled by fear. We're not going to be ruled by that. We want that to be the driving force is that we're going to be courageous, but we're going to be dependent upon God. We're going to be wise with what he speaks to our heart. Look at Luke 22, verse 42. Jesus speaks these words in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to show you some stuff here in just a moment. Mel's going to share with you something very powerful. But I want you to look at this verse. Jesus says this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. It took courage to face the cross. We just celebrated Easter. But it it takes courage to face the cross because on him is going to be the sins of humanity. The things that you and I do wrong are on his shoulders and guess what? He knew it. And that took courage to face that. It also took wisdom to understand something. 
Because here we see him being totally understanding, saying, not my will be done, but yours, God. Because he was wise enough to know that we could not be redeemed. We could not be restored without that perfect sacrifice for mankind. He was wise enough to know that. And he was courageous enough to face it. Now, when Jared and I went to Israel a few months ago, um, we got to see the place where they believe is the Garden of Gethsemane, right down towards the bottom of the Mountain of Olives. And um, it was a great, you know, great moment, and it's a beautiful place. And our guide was saying, well, this could have been the rock where Jesus just prayed and where he invited his disciples to come pray with him, and they ended up falling asleep. And it said, but when Jesus prayed, he was praying so intensely. He, he knew what was coming, and he was praying so intensely about it that he literally, like, sweat drops of blood. Now, Jesus didn't base this choice on fear. He didn't base it on his emotions. He didn't base it knowing what was coming. He made the choice to stay in that garden. Now, it was night, and literally, we're going to show a map. But literally, if he had just walked over the backside of the Mount of Olives, is wilderness area. It would be what we would call like desert. It just lost barren ground. If, if he would have went wandering in the um, just barrenness. And you know what? Everyone would have forgot about him. And they would have said, oh, Jesus, yeah, well, he's gone. We don't need to worry about him anymore. Don't worry about this whole crucifixion coming up. He made the choice, the courageous choice to stay. It was dark. He could have walked away. And he said, no, I, this is the only way for man to be restored to, back to God. It's an amazing choice. And I, I just, we wanted to show you this picture because we wanted to give you the perspective of how close it was. There you see Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. There's the Garden of Gethsemane down here in the valley. And then right up here on the top of the hill is where the wilderness begins. It could have been that easy for him to disappear. But he was courageous enough for you and I to have freedom. And he was wise enough to understand what it would take. That's huge. That's an amazing God that we serve, amen? That's huge. It's so close in proximity. He could have vanished, like Melanie said, but in the darkness of the night, he's faced what only he could face for you and I. That is meekness displayed so well. He was strong, but he was easy to live with, and he knew that being meek, having this great authority and power could be under control so that way he could give his life away for you and I. Huge, massive revelation to us in the heart of God. It's huge. <laughs> So as we reflect Jesus, because we are his disciples, I just want to remind us again that we've got to, these are the components that are going to help us become meek, authoritative, but humble, active, but dependent, and courageous, but wise. When we put these together, we develop meekness in our lives that will become the motives of our heart that will drive us towards what God wants to do in us through the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit. These motives have to be present in us. And I believe meekness is available for every one of us. And I think moms do a great job of modeling it so well. You are great in your meekness. And we appreciate your love and your service to your children and your grandchildren and those that you raise up. We couldn't have what we have today without you. It's huge. So thank you. We're honored that you could be a great vessel and representation of the meekness that we see Jesus modeling as well. It's huge. Speaking of being courageous, I want to share something with you. And if you're a guest with us today, I just want to say thanks for your grace in the next few moments because we're going to share a couple things that kind of affect the whole Bethel family. And um, with this, I think about some of the things that have taken place over the years for us here at Bethel. And when I look around this room, this is the very room that I found Jesus and I discovered Jesus was in this room. When I think about the people that come in here and we had time to pray up here, you know, Pastor Keith had some of you come up if you needed prayer, and there was moments where God's just interacting with our heart. These moments are precious, aren't they? They're moments that make our lives connected in relationship because we believe here at Bethel that we can experience God. And one of the things that we can do is we love people. And sometimes you might meet somebody very new for the very first time in one of our four years. You walk in the room and this is where you meet somebody and you create a friendship that hopefully lasts a lifetime. And then as you're a, as you're a parent and you walk in, and especially if you're a new parent and you've got you know, your, your new baby to bring them into the nursery where they find out 
the joys of life, and they discover just the basic stories of who Jesus is and what the Bible says. The nursery is a huge part, too. All over this building, on this floor, huge things happen every week in people's lives. And this is simply just a tool so that people can interact and encounter God. It is a huge deal for us. Now, just over six years ago, this church stepped out in a courageous way, and they built on this addition back behind us. And if you've been here very long, you know what I'm talking about. There's an atrium and a gymnasium. And the purpose of this building was to interact with the kids in the neighborhood, to interact with our neighborhood and be something for the people so they could understand and find Christ by just coming here and understanding that we are easy to live with, okay? And when we built that building on, there's a lot of things that change. And one of the things that was agreed to with the city is that we would put a sprinkler system, a fire suppression system in this, in this part of the building. If you look up in the ceiling, there isn't one. Now, the board and I, we've been praying, we've been talking about the options and the things that are ahead of us. Now, we could just say, yeah, we've got to put a sprinkler system in. But as we begin to talk about the moments, and as I begin to reflect on the moments that have taken place in this room, even for my own life, as I begin to think about the, the conversations I've had out there in the foyer and by the doors, and as I think about the kids that go into our nursery every week and they get loved on, it's more about providing a place that provides quality ministry that changes lives. I'll tell you what, I come here every week because I see the fruit on the tree. I see the lives changed. And we want to see so many more. How many want to see more? And so because of that, we want to provide something that helps us not only meet city code, but helps us meet the ministry of the people in this room, you, and the ministry of those who have yet to discover this amazing person that we have called Jesus. That's what this is about. So we want to share this with you for a second. Guys, we all like models, so here you go, all right? We are proposing a remodel of this entire floor for the church. And so, as I remove the roof, you will see that this is the first phase of the proposed changes that we are going to ask you to pray about and consider for us to do as a church. So not only do we meet city code, but we also meet the ministry that God has been doing here every week and God's going to continue to do every week. We've got another, uh, just a schematic here that we'll just show, share with you too. And um, we actually, as a board and as leadership, we developed three phases. And we are just presenting to you the first phase because we want to show you that we are planning and we're praying and saying, God, we're here for the long haul if that's your will. We're here for the long haul. And before we close, uh, I just want to say I'm just so excited about this and the possibility of a new, fresh, clean nursery area for our youngest disciples and just a place where young families can come and feel comfortable dropping off their little ones. And that's just really exciting for me, especially as a children's pastor. <laughs> um, but as we close... I want to give this information okay. real quick. Hold on. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. Sorry. Sorry. I, I just officially, though, I want to say this, okay? For all of us in the congregation here. June 1st. Say June 1st. June 1st. All right, you guys are listening. June 1st, we are going to have a special service. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have one service that day at 11 o'clock. All right? So we're asking our earlier folks at 8.30 to come in and join us. We're all going to pack into this room, and we're going to have a celebratory time just loving on Jesus and thanking him for the life that he's given us, and we're going to worship together. And after the service, we're going to have a special called business meeting. Everyone's welcome to stay, but membership is going to be asked to help make a decision whether they're going to empower the board to move forward with this plan. And we are going to, over the next few weeks, we're going to present to you all the information. We're going to present to you all the things that you need to know. And we want you to be in prayer about it because this is about, is it time for us to move forward with this? And we want to do this as a church family. And everyone's welcome to be a part of that meeting. It's going to be a fun time on June 1st. And uh, I want to tell you, it's just been amazing to see the lives change as they walk in the door and as they encounter Jesus. But there are so many more lives that could be changed if we can address the needs of our facility. Even on Easter, we had friends that were here in wheelchairs that couldn't even use our restrooms because they weren't ADA. And so we want to make a difference. We want to make sure that everyone's welcome here and everybody connects to Jesus. Everybody finds relationship. And we're going to present you the information. 
over the next few weeks. And we're going to come together on June 1, and we're going to share with you all the facts about where our church is. We're going to share with you where we're at financially. We're going to share with you at where our budget is. We're going to give you all the facts, and then we're going to ask you to prayerfully consider empowering the board to move forward with this project. So, guys, ultimately, this is about his glory. This isn't about just a nicer place to sit in. This is simply a tool so more people know Jesus. Amen? And... Um, Today, we want you to be able to come up afterwards, and you can ask us questions, and you can look at the model and the drawings, and we'll be here for a little while hanging out. But I know Melanie wants to share something that's just about moms, because we, we want to bring it back to you. We needed to get this information out, but moms, today's your day, and we want to just share with you on this. So I just want to read a blog called Why God Made a Mother by Ann Voskamp. God said, I need someone to get up at midnight and scoop the most fragile of humanity close to her warmth and rock, though she can hardly stand, and nourish, though she's mostly sleep-deprived, and change the diaper and the sheets and the leaked on, leaked through and leaked down clothes, though she'll have to change them in the morning and next week, and that won't change for years. So God made a mother. That God had said, I need someone with a strong heart, strong enough for toddler tantrums and teenage testing, yet broken enough to fall on her knees and pray, and pray, and pray. And someone that knows in every hard place is exactly where you extend grace, who looks a hopeful child in the eye and says yes, even though yes means a mess. But this is how you bless, so God made a mother. God said, I need somebody who can shape a soul and find shoes on Sunday mornings and get grass stains out of Levi's and make dinner out of nothing and do it again 79,678 more times (laughs) and keep kids off the road and out of the toilet and in clean underwear and mainly alive, though she's mainly losing her mind and will put in an 80-hour week by Wednesday night and keep on going another 80 hours because raising generations matters and weaving families matters and tying heartstrings matters. So God made a mother. It had to be someone who could comb back pigtails and tie up skates, who could pretend she remembered algebra and how to get home from here. And really, that she was just fine. No, really, it just had to be those silly onions. (laughs) Someone who would run for the catch, jump on a trampoline, and play one fierce game of soccer. Someone who'd stay up late with the science project, who'd get up early for the game, and someone who'd wave at the door until the taillights were out of sight. So God made a mother. It had to be someone willing to keep loving when it made no sense because that's what love does. Someone who knew that life is a gift. Somebody willing to feed and lead and lay down her life and pick up her cross and give of her time because they gave her heart. Someone who knows that we all blow it, but what matters most is what we do afterwards. Someone who would know that umbilical cords can be cut, but heartstrings never can. So God made a mother. Moms, you're awesome. Can we thank our moms one more time? Would you stand with us this morning? We just want to pray a blessing over moms in the room and pray a blessing over you. And we just appreciate you spending your Mother's Day with us today. God, we thank you for every mom in this room, every grandmother, and everyone who has touched the life of a child. We pray a special blessing, God, over them. We pray that you would give them strength and encouragement and let them know today that, God, they have done so much to change lives. Lord, I pray that you encourage them for the walk and the road that may be ahead of them. And Lord, I pray a special blessing over everyone that has impacted these children. And I pray that, God, you would go with everyone in this room, that you would go before them and come behind them, that you would bless them with your very holy presence and give them everything and anything that they need. And God, we pray that you will lead us and guide us to become more meek, that we would be like you, Jesus, and we'd reflect you as your disciples, that we'd have the motive of our heart right with you. And God, we pray for this building program that we've just announced. Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts, that you'll bring revelation to us as a body and a family as we move forward to June 1st to make the decision. God, we give this all to you, and we say thank you for making moms that make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Happy Mother's Day, and we'll be up here if you want to have any questions about the model.